In my previous video I have demonstrated how I have built this Commodore 64 PLA chip replacement. However it worked fine on my C64 board revision. Some of my friends on Twitter tested this chip inside their C64 machines and there were some boards where it did not function at all. In this video I am going to dive a bit deeper into the PLA chip, investigate the reason why it does not work on all C64 machines and then try to fix it. This video is sponsored by PCBWay, which makes very high quality boards. You just need to upload your design in Gerber files on their website and before you know it, they will be manufactured and delivered at your doorstep. First, I wanted to make a circuit that will test the logic of the PLA chip just to make sure that there aren't any mistakes in the translation of the inputs to the outputs. Then use that circuit and a logic analyzer to measure the delays that are triggered inside the chip. Try to fix it and then finally test it. I have gathered all of the components that I thought would be needed for an Arduino PLA chip tester. My first impulse was just to stick the PLA chip and an Arduino Nano into the breadboard and connect all of the inputs and outputs of the PLA to the Arduino pins until I quickly realized that there are not enough pins on the Nano as we need at least 24 I.O. pins to do the job. So I have decided to use this 74HC595 chip which has an 8-bit shift register with ledge capabilities that will let us shift in serial data using just one of the Arduino pins and convert it to parallel output. When we use two of these chips, we can address all of the 16 inputs of the PLA chip simultaneously. As I didn't have a version of these chips that fit into my breadboard, I had to solder it to a PCB which is capable of holding up to 20 pin SOP packages with pin headers. Now it was just a matter of sticking the Arduino Nano, two of the 74HC595 chips and my PLA replacement chip into the breadboard. To design the schematics I have used KiCad. Let me hook up the breadboard and explain how it works. First we will connect ground from the Arduino to the shift register chips and the Easy PLA. These brown wires will connect the output enable of the 74HC595 chip so it will always stay on. The data will be output immediately after we toggle the latch output pin. We will also need 5 volts which we will tap from the Arduino Nano. The reset pin of the latch shift register will also be connected to 5 volts as we will never need to trigger it. The green wires connect to D10 output of the Arduino as I will show later. It will trigger the storage register clock. These wires connect to the D11 output of the Arduino and will toggle the shift register clock of the 74HC595 chip. Arduino output D12 will be used to program data values into the register. The two shift register chips need to be chained together so that the serial data output, pin 9, will connect to the serial data input, pin 14, of the other chip. I am connecting them using these yellow wires. The parallel outputs Q8 through QH of both chips need to be connected to the PLA inputs I0 through I15. To test if the outputs of the Easy PLA will give correct values, I will connect them to the Arduino inputs D2 through D9. Pins D0 and D1 are used for serial communication and programming the chip, so it is better to leave them unconnected. Before we proceed with the creation of the Arduino sketch that will do the Easy PLA logic tests, let's have a look at this PDF document called C64 PLA Dissected. Here, the whole PLA chip is analyzed by using die photographs of a real PLA chip. It contains a full logic table that can be used to create logic tests. I have copied this table to a text editor and aligned it a bit to be able to create an array inside the Arduino IDE. PLA inputs that are set to logic 1 are marked with stars and logic 0 is represented with a slash. A dot basically means that it doesn't matter what value you input. Inside the Arduino IDE, 
this array represents the same. It is rotated by 90 degrees and I made it a bit more readable by replacing the stars with ones, slashes with zeros and the dot values with axes. I did the same for the outputs. Note that the cast RAM table is the only value that is inverted. Before I will show you the code, let me demonstrate a simulation how the true 74HC595 chips work as this will help in understanding the Arduino code. What I have drawn here is the internal representation of the two chips interconnected to each other. Internally, the chip contains a shift register and a latch. When the shift register clock transits from low to high, whatever is on the data pin will be pushed inside that register. After the eighth pulse, the Q7 output will be passed to the data input of the second chip, so a total of 16 bits can be programmed. After we toggle the storage register clock, the contents of the shift registers will be stored on the latch. You can see the contents as they are indicated by the red LEDs. In our case, we will use these outputs and connect them to the inputs of the EasyPLA chip. Let's quickly go through the code. After defining the arrays for inputs and expected outputs, we are setting things up for the 74HC595 chip. Like the register and shift clocks, serial data input, chip enable, and the Arduino inputs that will receive data from the PLA chip. All the magic happens inside the loop function. In the beginning, we have a for loop that iterates through all of the test cases. We start the cycle by disabling the PLA chip and setting the chip enable pin to high. This way we can set all of its inputs and it will not output anything until we pull the signal back to low. Now we need to set the register clock of the 74HC595 chips to low to make sure that the output of the storage register will be disabled. I am also printing the test case number we are currently processing. And this string variable will help us with the processing in what is happening in the second for loop. Here we will push all of the values from the current test case into the shift register. Just like in the simulation, we first need to set the shift register clock pin, that is D11, to low. Then we set the data bit according to the contents of the array on D12. If it is a 1 or a 0 inside the array, we do a digital write with that value. If it's an X, then it actually does not matter what we set, but I have chosen to set the value to true. The value of the actual test case string variable is updated with these values. After that, we do a short delay of 50 microseconds and set the shift register clock on D11 to high, as the value of SR data should be shifted on the rising clock pulse. We wait again for 50 microseconds and repeat the cycle for all of the 16 values of the test case. At this point, all of the data values are shifted inside the shift register of both chips. Now we can store them on the latch and this will output the values immediately to the inputs of the EasyPLA chip, as we have wired the output enable of the 74HC595 chips to ground. We do that by first setting the shift register clock on D11 to low. And this is just to finish the shift register clock cycle. Then we set the storage register clock on D10 to high. Now the chip enable pin of the EasyPLA can be set to low, and this will allow it to read all the input values. We do a short pause and set the storage register clock on D10 to low, which will end the cycle of the storage register. Now we can test the values that the EasyPLA will output after it has received all of the inputs from the test case. Again, we are creating some string variables that will help to compare the test results. The first variable is what we expect and it is a copy from the output array that is defined above. Then we read the Arduino pins which contain the data of the EasyPLA outputs and store them inside the tested variable. When there is a value of x, it is added to the tested variable. The actual string variable stores only zeros and ones. The expected and tested variables are compared and if they are equal, then the test case passes. 
otherwise it fails. Failed test cases are counted and shown in the final output if any tests failed. Finally, we disable the PLA by setting the chip enable pin to high and end with an infinite loop. This code is specially designed to test the logic of the PLA chip, but it can easily be changed to test other kinds of chips that use a logic table. A link to download the Arduino sketch is in the description of this video. Let's connect Arduino to the computer, upload the code and see what happens. And three of the tests have failed. But is the chip faulty or is there a problem with some connections on the breadboard? Could I have made a mistake by misplacing the wires on the breadboard? There it is. This wire should go here and that one over there. Let's try it now. And this time all tests passed. That means that the truth tables are correctly implemented. But will this also work on an original PLA? Let's replace the easy PLA with this PLA that I pulled out of a working Commodore 64. Attach the USB to monitor the results and... Luckily, this also works. But somehow, the Easy PLA does not work on all C64 revision boards. Let's dive back into the PLA dissected PDF. On page 20, there is a mention that the CAS RAM signal must be delayed by the PLA by at least a certain time. As the CAS signal from the VIC-2 is also used to multiplex the address bus for the DRAM address inputs. This is done with U13 and U25, which have a maximum propagation delay from their select inputs, which is CAS RAM, to the outputs of 24 nanoseconds. Typical DRAM chips used in C64 have an address setup time of at least 0 nanoseconds before CAS. An example is in the HM4864A. This means that the CAS RAM signal must be delayed by at least this time, otherwise the DRAMs would latch the wrong column address. This timing dependency could be called a design flaw in the C64. The multiplex address changes about 15 nanoseconds after CAS and becomes stable just about 10 nanoseconds before CAS RAM gets active on this board. To investigate this problem, I have attached a logic analyzer to the outputs of the PLA. I am also attaching one of the inputs in order to measure the delay. This setup still has the original C64 PLA connected. Also, the chip enable pin that outputs directly from the Arduino is connected to one of the inputs of the logic analyzer. Let's connect the USB cable to the logic analyzer. We are now inside the logic analyzer software. On the left, you can see all of the outputs F0 through F7 the chip enable pin and the last is the A13 input. We can now capture the whole test sequence. 5 seconds of data should be enough. It gives me time to trigger the reset button on the Arduino. Let's find the beginning where the input is being triggered and set some markers to measure the delay between input and output of the original PLA. We can see that it is around 30 nanoseconds. Let's replace the original PLA with Easy PLA and capture the sequence again. After we zoom in, we see that the delay is now 5 nanoseconds, which certainly explains why the Easy PLA was not working on some Commodore 64 revision boards. I am actually surprised that it worked at all. To delay the signal, I will use the 74 LS00 chip, which has 4 NAND gates simply because I have a couple of them lying around. According to the datasheet, the transition from low to high and high to low is between 3 and 15 nanoseconds, so my idea is to chain two NAND gates together to get the desired delay. I will not delay all of the output pins, as according to the PLA dissected document, only the CASROM output delay really matters. Let's insert the NAND chip and wire it up so the signal of the CASRAM output will go through just one NAND gate. 
It will be inverted, but this way I can see if this method will work at all. After hooking up the outputs to the logic analyzer and capturing the sequence, I noticed that the CASRAM signal was always high. But why is that? Then I connected the output to the scope so I could see exactly what was happening. And I found out that the signal was toggling between 1.3 and 3.7 volts. When we look at the datasheet of the 74LS00 chip, it shows that the low signal needs to be lower than 0.8 volts. And because the output of the NAND gate was at 1.3 volt, it could never see the low output signal and was always high. To fix this, I have added a 1K pull-up resistor from the output to the ground, which should lower the low output signal of the NAND gate. And when we look at the scope, we can see that the low signal is now at 350 millivolts, which should be low enough to trigger the logical zero. Now I could wire up the CASRAM signal to the second NAND gate and see if it will work. After capturing the sequence, we can see that it works now. So let's zoom in and see the delay that is now on the signal. We now have 10 nanoseconds of delay more than the other output signals have. Let's see if it's enough by hooking up another breadboard with just the easy PLA on it with the delay chip. My method is a bit awkward, but I have managed to connect it to the PLA socket. Moment of truth. And it works. I will still need to change the easy PLA PCB that shall include the 74LS00 chip and the pull down resistor, but this is a matter for the next video. I have also tried to change the delay of the chip by using a crystal oscillator and by changing the VHDL code, but I could not make it work on a breadboard as the speed of the crystal was 32 MHz. I might create another version of a PCB with a crystal in place and try this again. But for now, that's it for this video. I hope that you learned something new and I hope to see you again in the future. Bye!